Those questions have been negative. I know these questions have been hard to take. I had some people say to me last week when we talked about technology and artificial intelligence and uh, transhumanism, they were afraid. They, they left the class in fear. So, that's why there's nobody here. Yeah, maybe so. We're down today. I think it's a football game. Anyway, we're going to certainly change the atmosphere of our lesson today as we talk about the greatness of our God. This this is going to be so encouraging and so uplifting and so helpful to you. So uh, take that in, if you would. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for the privilege of teaching your word. And I, I thank you, Lord, that there are places in your scripture which gives us such a positive outlook in the face of such a dark world. So honor God the teaching, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 When I was a child, maybe three or four years of age, something like that, my mother said I needed to pray the prayer at the dinner table. So she gave me a memorized prayer. Perhaps you prayed the same prayer as a child. God is great, God is good, and we thank him for our food. Amen. <laughs> well, I prayed that prayer night after night at the dinner table. Until finally mother said to me, you're old enough now not to recite a memorized prayer, you're old enough to pray your own prayer. And I was a little shocked by that. Now, I don't remember what we had to eat that night. It was too many years ago, I just remember this whole scenario I'm talking about. But I looked the food over, and I said, uh, God, I thank you for the milk and the dessert that Mother has made, but please tell Mother we don't want any more fish sticks and so on. <laughs> and uh, that was my first prayer that was unmemorized. <laughs> well, in my first memorized prayer, I was taught the greatness of God. But as I have matured in life, I've come more and more to appreciate His greatness. And that's what we want to talk about today. I've come to believe the root of every problem in a Christian's life. But this is so important. I've come to believe the root of every problem in a Christian's life is a misunderstanding of who God is and what He can do. Most people have a small God. I want to enlarge your God today. Because our God is great Amen. <laughs> and greatly to be held. So, this is what the psalmist says Great is the Lord and highly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. So, when we stop to think of God's greatness, the characteristics we are reminded of first of all, God is eternal. God is neither beginning nor end. He cannot be measured or controlled by time, which he made over, which he rules over. So he made time and he rules over time. God is unchangeable. God's character and plans remain the same from the beginning of time, and his actions are always consistent with his own nature and purposes. God is omnipresent. God is everywhere at the same time, as his presence fills both heaven as well as earth. God is omnipotent. God is all-powerful and does whatever he pleases. And God is perfect. God is complete and lacking in nothing in himself. God is holy. God is supremely different than his creation. He is righteous in every respect. Well, we've not really begun to exhaust the attributes of God that make it great. We can still single out his love, his justice, his forgiveness, his grace, his mercy, and compassion, his patience, his faithfulness. He is all of these and much, much more. Now we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 45. The prophet demonstrates some of these attributes of God toward his people Israel but also toward those of us who have been called according to his purpose. So as we talk about the greatness of God, the first thing we read in Isaiah chapter 45, as we look at those first four verses, 
is the sovereignty of God. God is a sovereign God. And he talks first of all about God's sovereignty concerning Cyrus. Remember Cyrus was the ruler of Persia that conquered the Babylonians, a pagan king. Here's what the text says, verse 1, Isaiah 45. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings, to open before him the double doors, so the gates will not be shut. So God has just introduced the name of this future pagan king who will deliver the Jews from Babylonian captivity. He's called Cyrus by name, 100 years before Cyrus was ever born. Cyrus is God's anointed, and God takes hold of his right hand to defeat the kings of many, many nations. God does the same thing for us. He anoints us. That's the Holy Spirit coming in and anointing us. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. He holds our hand. He gives us victory over the evil one, and he opens doors for us that no one can shut. Now the difference between us and Cyrus, Cyrus was a secular leader used by God to do his sovereign will against the physical powers of this world. God is sovereign. He will use whoever he chooses for his glory, and to be sure, if God will use a pagan to accomplish his will, he will use you, and hopefully has been using you and I think every one of us need to ask ourselves, what have I been doing for the Lord lately? <laughs> Isaiah then tells us how the Lord will go before Cyrus and prepare the way for his conquests. He will assist Cyrus and make the crooked places straight, break in pieces the gates of bronze, and cut the bars of iron. That's verse 2. What God did for Cyrus in the physical realm Listen, he has done for us in the realm of the spiritual. Isaiah already prophesied that with the coming of the Messiah, he will make the mountains low, the crooked places straight, and the rough places smooth. That's Isaiah chapter 40, verse 4. Isaiah was using an analogy to say that when the Messiah comes, the way to God will be made easy. He will reveal the glory of the Father. He will show us the only way, for he is the way. What, I'm, what we're saying is easy, God is saying, to come to know him through Jesus Christ. It's easy to have forgiveness of sins. It's easy to have a relationship with God. He's lowered the mountains. He's straightened out the paths. That's the point. Well, he's done the same thing for Cyrus. So that Cyrus can accomplish the will of God, which primarily is going to be the conquest of the Babylonians. Also, he will break the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron, the text says. This Cyrus will do in conquering his enemies. But how might we relate this to our spiritual walk? Well, there's an attempt today to shut down the church, to quiet her message. As we talked about last week, which I just learned from Tony in a sermon that he gave, YouTube will no longer carry biblical sermons by evangelical pastors. The gospel is being censored. Mm -hmm. But instead, this, oh, this is so good. But instead of bars that would lock up the church, and gates of hell that would confine and destroy the church. The Lord promised that all attempts to silence and destroy his church will not prevail. The gates of hell are not going to be open for the church. See? The church will never, never die. That's his point. Instead, he will break in pieces those gates and cut apart those bars. For the true church of Jesus Christ will stand victorious in the end, and all of those who have attempted to silence her voice will be destroyed. God is sovereign over all. He has the very last word. His truth will outlast the lies. The 
that blasphemed his word and his church. Then God says this to Cyrus. This is verses 3 and 4 of chapter 45. I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places, that you may know that I, the Lord, who call you by your name, am the God of Israel. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect, I have even called you by your name. I have named you, though you have not known me. As Cyrus conquers the nations of the world, he will find hidden treasures that God said would be his. In other words, you conquer a nation, you collect the booty, the booty belongs to you, all the things that you find, all the treasures that you get from conquering a nation that you're going to go to Cyrus. I mean, he's going to be a wealthy guy. He will discover that the God of Israel named him before he was born. He's going to learn that. And he will know that he was a servant of God by releasing the Jews from Babylonian captivity and returning them to their homeland to rebuild the temple and the city of Jerusalem. When this pagan king was confronted with all this from Isaiah's prophecy, I, I kind of wonder what impact it would have on him. I mean, if he knew. Here's a God who knew he was going to be born a hundred years in advance, named him the name that his mother and dad gave him, and then conquer the Babylonians, become ruler of the world. What, what, would, what would go through a person's mind when they would hear something like that? But I think the question we have to ask is what impact does this have on you? So we want to take this down to our level. He calls you by your name just as he called Cyrus by his name. He knew about you before the foundations of the world. He has treasures in heaven waiting for you. Treasures that will not rust or be stolen. He has called you to be a servant of his, doing his will and accomplishing his purposes by living righteously by sharing his gospel with those who know it not, and by standing behind the Jewish people and the nation of Israel. If there's one important message for us to understand from all of this, it is God is sovereign. He's sovereign over all. What he declares will happen. He has absolute control over his creation. As the psalmist said, God has spoken once, twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God. Psalm 62, verse 11. Again, the psalmist says, whatever the Lord pleases, he does, in heaven and in earth, in the sea and in the deep parts of the sea. That's Psalm 135, verse 6. Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar that God is in control and not human beings or a human king. He changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and he raises up kings. We are living in a day when violence is raging around us. I think we all know that. Crime is at a record high. Hatred for Jesus Christ and his church has never been more evident. Immorality has never been more blatant. Yet we must understand this is all in this, this is all in the knowledge of God and under his control. Everything I talked about over the last three weeks, which was dark and evil, God knew all about it from the very beginning of time. And he's still in control. Therefore, let's not fear. Even though certainly there is scary news, is there not? So in God's time and in God's way, this evil system will all come crashing down. For the word of the Lord prevails forever. He is the one who has the final say. For he alone is the sovereign God and that's the thing I really want us to, to remember when we leave here. God is great because he's sovereign. He's in control. Next, I want to talk about the superiority of God because that's the next section in Isaiah chapter 45. Not only is 
He's sovereign. He's superior to all other gods. His message of superiority is about himself. That's the first thing we say. Notice what he said, beginning in verse 5. I am the Lord and there is no other. There is no God besides me. I have equipped you through. I equip you, though you do not know me, that you may know from the rising of the sun to its setting that there is none besides me. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. I, the Lord, do all these things. God is superior to all kings and rulers of the earth. We're going to learn that. God's greatness is seen in his superiority over kings and rulers. Cyrus was an idolatrous ruler. God was doing his work through Cyrus that he might know that God alone is the one true God. That there is no God beside him. He equipped Cyrus to conquer the world, even though Cyrus did not even know him. There has been one God, and that's the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who revealed himself in the person of Jesus Christ, yet the world is still trying to push the philosophy that all roads lead to God. If you're a Muslim, if you're a Buddhist, if you're a Hindu, if you are a good moral atheist, then when your life comes to an end, we will all wind up in the same place. That is damnable teaching. That is the most damnable heresy that I can possibly think of. And yet, church, this is something that is creeping into the evangelical movement today. There are more and more evangelical pastors that are giving up on the idea that Jesus is the only way by which man can come to God. I will tell you, that will never be taught in this class. Remember, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes from the Father but by me. So we're learning now God is superior to other gods. And so God says, there is no God besides me. God continues to elevate his greatness over the other gods. He said, I form light and create darkness. This is one of the most difficult passages in the book of Isaiah. And one of the most controversial. And you'll see why. The very first words of God in scripture are, let there be light. Then we read, and God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. That's right now, Genesis chapter 1, beginning at verse 3. God created both light and darkness. No other God can make such a statement. God is superior now to other gods in that he makes peace and creates calamity. Not only did God create light and darkness, he says, I make peace and create calamity. Now, here's where the problem comes. And here's what makes this a very difficult verse. The Hebrew word translated calamity is the word ra. And it could be translated bad or evil. In fact, if you have a copy of the King James Version of the Bible and you were to look up Isaiah chapter 45, verse 7, here's what it would say. I will make peace and create evil. Hmm. So now we have to ask ourselves, is God responsible for evil? How are we going to understand what the King James Version is talking about? Or aren't they getting the translation right? That's the question. So do we believe that God creates evil? Of course not. The prophet of Habakkuk wrote, You are of pure eyes and to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. That's Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 13. James tells us that God can't be tempted by evil and he tempts no one. James chapter 1 beginning at verse 13. Temptation to evil comes from the misguided desires of the human heart because the human heart it's evil. Now it can be redeemed, but it can only be redeemed through Christ. God does not create evil, but God does cause calamity. He brings disastrous storms and plagues. He causes the floods and famines. He brought death into the world as punishment for sin. 
calamities can turn one to God while turning others away from God. Calamities can benefit some while being a curse to others. Here's an example of that. Calamity for Babylon in her defeat at the hands of King Cyrus of Persia meant deliverance for the Jews from Babylon. To the Babylonians, this was a curse to be defeated by the king of Persia, but to the Jews, it was a blessing. God is superior to other gods and that he uses nature for righteous purposes. Isaiah continues to speak of God's greatness by referring to nature and how it demonstrates his righteousness. Notice he says in verse 8, Rain down, you heavens, from above, and let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open. Let them bring forth salvation. Let righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. The commentator uh, Oswald Chambers wrote of this verse, just as the sky that God has created cannot help but pour forth rain, and the earth that God has created cannot help but bring forth plants, so God the Creator can only pour out on His people right dealings and mighty deliverances in all His relations with them. In other words, God shows His power over nature to deal righteously with His creation. He created us, therefore, he provides the means to sustain us. This is another form of God's grace. It's often called common grace. Jesus said, for example, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. So that's a common grace. Even those who are sinners and, and refuse to come to know God as their, as their heavenly father, God still provides rain so they can grow crops. God still allows the sun to shine down. So it's a common grace that God gives. He shows his mercy to all, the just of the unjust. He does what is right for all his creation with the understanding that some will show their gratitude and find salvation and produce righteousness while others will still reject him. We should need to be reminded that we are to live righteously in the righteousness of God which comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all that believe, Romans chapter 3. In Christ we have experienced both common grace, so we get some rain once in a while, but there's also a saving grace, and that's only for those who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So we've talked now about the sovereignty of God, how God is in control over everything, even though it may seem at times that's not the case. We've talked about the superiority of God. God's greater than all other gods that people might worship. Now we want to talk about the straightforwardness of God. And this is verses 9 and 10 of chapter 45. God warns Israel not to strive against him. Notice he says, woe to him who strives with his maker. Isaiah then gives examples of how foolish that would be. Should a broken piece of pottery question the potter, he asks? Should a piece of clay even question the maker? What are you making of me? Should one's hand say to the handyman, you have no permission to use my hands to do your job? Should a child have a right to question his parents as to why they brought him into the world? course not. Neither have we a right to show disapproval to the Creator's work. The Lord can work sovereignly over individuals because He is the Creator. And when one strives against God by protesting God's work, they risk the impending doom from the Lord, and uh, that's surely going to come. Because twice the word woe appears in our text. You see that in verse 9 as well as in verse 10. Woe is not only a word of warning, 
It is a word of impending judgment. So people question God all the time. Now let me give you a, a good example of this. Oops. I get this on the right spot here. I, uh, I had some former neighbors that lived uh, when I was living in the city of uh, Walnut, and uh, they uh, they gave birth to a child with Down syndrome. And throughout the mother's pregnancy, she was warned of the possibility that this child would have Down syndrome, and was encouraged time and time again by the medical staff at the hospital to abort the child. But she and her husband refused because they were Christians. They believed that no child disabled or not was worthless and should have the right to live. As the child grew, the parents would speak of how their disabled son taught them more about love and dependency than their two other normal children. They never questioned God as to why one of their children was born with Down syndrome Yet people will question God as to why he would create a child with severe handicaps. And also question the wisdom of the parents as to why they would allow such a child to be born. When, when, when that Moses was called, you'll remember this. When Moses was called by the Lord to go to Egypt and stand before Pharaoh and say to him, Let my people go. He gave several excuses as to why he was not qualified. One of his excuses was being that he, uh, he stuttered and he was slow, slow of speech. So the Lord said that this is so, I've used this verse many, many times in talking with parents who have a handicapped child. Here it is. This is why God says to Moses, because he stutters. Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I, the Lord? Disability is no accident. In John chapter 9, for example, we read of a man who was blind from birth. His disciples wanted to know who was responsible for his blindness. The sins of his parents? Or did he sin while in the womb of his mother? That's interesting now. The Jewish rabbis would say it's possible for a fetus to commit sin. And maybe that's the very reason why somebody then is born with some kind of handicap because they sinned in the womb of their mother. Well, how did Jesus respond to this? He said, neither this man nor his mother sinned. But rather, this was done that God should be revealed in him. So God doesn't make mistakes. We are created with a purpose. God is saying, I'm going to let this person be born the way they are. I have a plan. I have a design. And I have a purpose for their life. We may, not, uh, we may not understand why God allows things to happen as they do. It is not always up to us to understand. However, it is up to us to trust in God who is in what we are to trust in who God is and what God does. So how we relate to all of this? Well, the prophet is saying to Israel, you have no right to question God when it comes to your capacity or to your captivity under Babylon, nor why God would use a pagan like Cyrus to set you free. God is God, and he's sovereign over all. So here's the issue. You see, the uh, Isaiah is assuming that 
The people in Babylon are going to, the Jews who were in Babylonian captivity are going to question God. Why are we here in this captivity? And why are you using some pagan king to release us? See, that's the idea. So they're uh, questioning God. They're challenging God in this case. So we have now uh, the, uh, the submission to God. Here's, here's what we're, we're talking about. We're talking about the sovereignty of God. The God is in control over all things. We're talking about the superiority of God. That God is greater than all other gods. We're talking about the straightforwardness of God. That we have no right to challenge what God is uh, doing. So this now leads to uh, submission to God. It seems clear that Israel has a hard time submitting to the idea that God would raise up a pagan king like Cyrus to be used by God for his purposes. In verse 11 of Isaiah chapter 45, we read this. The Lord, the Holy One of Israel and his maker, Ask me of things concerning my sons, should be uh, plural there in your notes, it's singular, my sons, and concerning the work of my hands, you command me. So God is calling on Israel, to, I want you to submit to me, but notice there's five ways by which God is calling for this submission. Number one, submit by seeking God's will. It is one thing to ask God about why he does what he does in an attempt to understand. In fact, he invites us to do so. Ask of me. You don't understand something? Hey, talk to me about it. And I'll try to help you understand this. Maybe I'll show you a verse of scripture or whatever. Ask of me. He says, however, it is another thing to command me. Notice he said, you command me. You're demanding of me. If you listen to some of those TV preachers, like Kenneth Copeland, for example, you find them commanding God all the time. They pray, I command you in the name of Jesus. Maybe I can do a little better. I command you in the name of Jesus. <laughs> you got to get that Jesus out there. Right? Copeland did this over and over again concerning God removing COVID-19 pandemic. I don't know if you saw that on YouTube. I did. He's commanding God. He even told God the very day when it was to be gone. I command you! Get rid of this virus! And here's the day it's to go! Doesn't he look evil? <laughs> of course, Copeland's prayer was not answered according to the scheduled time. To command God to do anything is not only the height of arrogance, it is essentially saying that you have the power and the authority to tell God what to do. It is like God has to follow your orders rather than you follow his. It is proper to let our request be made known to God, but not ordered him to grant those requests. So we uh, submit to God by seeking his will. We submit to God because he's our creator. This we continue. God then reminds Israel that he has made the earth and created man to dwell on it. He stretches out the heavens and they respond under his command. He raised up Cyrus in righteousness and he will direct his ways. Cyrus will build my city and set my exiles free, and he will gain no reward for doing so, God says. He will do it because I am the Lord of hosts. See, I, he's going to do it because I'm telling him he's going to do it. Furthermore, God says, I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I did not say to the seed of Jacob, seek me in vain. Well, we're back to that ugly face again. <laughs> thought this would be easier trying it this way, but maybe it's not going to be. 
It's like a bear working on new things here, so we'll get there. Let's go back, Isaiah 45. I have not spoken in secret, and in uh, the dark place of the earth, he says, I did not say to the seed of Jacob, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. God has given Israel every reason why they should submit to him. And that is good advice for us as well. He created us, therefore we need to submit to his will. Here's the third thing. Submit because God will make your enemies your friends. God then reminds his people that those who have been their enemies and worship false gods like the Egyptians, the Ethiopians, the Sabaeans, will one day be subservient to Israel and will come to admit there is no other God but the God of Israel. This most likely will happen during the millennial reign of Christ when Israel will be the chief nation on the face of the earth and Christ is going to be ruling from the city of Jerusalem. This God is revealing that he and he alone knows the future and the wonderful plan that he has for those who have chosen him. So uh, when we're talking about why we should submit, submit by seeking God's will, submit because God is your creator, submit because God will make your enemies your friends. We said that probably for the Jews will be in the millennium and for us perhaps as well. Submit because God is greater than your idols. Isaiah says how God is different from the idols of other nations. Truly, you are God who hides yourself, O God of Israel, the Savior. So God is invisible because he's spirit. Man cannot behold that which is spirit and live. That's Exodus chapter 33. However, you can know that he is because of his mighty works as well as his ability to know the future. On the other hand, the gods of the pagans are visible, made of stone and wood, but the day will come when the pagans will be ashamed and disgraced by their idolatry. They will be confused as to why they ever made these idols in the first place. It was Indian philosopher and playwright Tagore who said, your idol is shattered in the dust to prove that God's dust is greater than your idol. But those who worship the God of Israel will never be ashamed or disgraced, for Israel will be saved by the Lord with an everlasting salvation. That's verses 15 through 17. It's the Apostle Paul now quoting from the book of Isaiah, chapter 28, verse 16. And he's, he's doing this from the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures. And Paul says, for... The scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. So God will never shame or disgrace those who worship him. He has made a promise to Israel of future plans, namely, to bring the Messiah into the world and to bring eternal salvation to a remnant of Jews who believe in him. And here's the fifth reason why we are to submit. So let's just review. We are to submit to God by seeking his will. We are to submit to God simply because he created us. We're to submit to God because he's going to make our enemies our friends. We are to submit to God because he's greater than any idol that somebody might worship. And finally, we are to submit to God because he will deliver, in this case Israel, from the nations of the world. Assemble yourselves and come. Draw near together. You who have escaped from the nations. That's verse 20 of chapter 45. It was the act of God that delivered the Jews from captivity and from the nations where they were scattered. In those nations, there were false gods. They prayed to gods that could not save. They worshipped gods that had no knowledge of ancient times. Or could they declare things from this time forward that didn't know the future? They had no knowledge of the past or the future. Then God says to them, Have not I, the Lord, a just God and a Savior? There is none besides me. I alone am the true God, who not only knows all things past, present, and future, but 
I am just and I am your Savior. <clears throat> so we're talking here about uh, next the salvation for all of the nations. So here's where we've gone in our lesson so far. This is the last point. We're talking about the sovereignty of God. We said that God is in control. Regardless of how dark things look today, God is in control. That's number one. We talked about the superiority of God. He's superior to any other God that somebody might worship. We talked about the straightforwardness of God. That is, God does not want to be challenged concerning what he does. You might inquire, God, I, I don't understand. Can you help me understand? That's okay. Ask of me, he says. But uh, don't challenge me. Don't be critical of what I do because I know what I'm doing and it's the right thing to do. And never command me. Okay? Ask of me, but don't command me. Don't be like a Kenneth Copeland, you know. I command you in the name of Jesus. <laughs> you can see that. Now here's the, uh, then there's the submission to God. We've just given you five points there. Let's look at salvation for all nations. This is uh, the end of our study from chapter 45. Verse 22. Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. Look to me or turn to me. Now that's what the gospel message is all about. To turn means to repent. We are to change the direction of our life from selfishness to a God-centered living. We are to forsake our idols and put our hope in our righteous creator and savior. This is not for the Jews only. It's a call to the ends of the earth. Everyone on the planet, regardless of race or nationality or time in which they live, everyone is invited to turn to God and be saved through Jesus Christ for there is no other way. That's Acts chapter 4 verse 12. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved, says Peter. God then says, I have sworn by myself the word has gone forth out of my mouth of righteousness and shall not return that to me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall take an oath. He shall say, surely, in the Lord I have righteousness and strength to him men shall come, and all shall be ashamed who are incensed against him. In the Lord all the descendants of the earth shall be justified, and shall glory in the Lord. Notice here, he says, God's taken an oath. He is sworn by himself. See? I'm taking an oath, I'm sworn by myself because there's no one greater than myself. You see that in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13. His word will not return void. Everyone will eventually confess and bow before him. It was the Apostle Paul who took up this very thought from the book of Isaiah. Remember these words. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every uh, shall bow of those in heaven, of those on the earth and those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Now there are those who teach what's called universalism. That is to say every person who's ever lived will eventually make it to heaven. Hitler will be there, Mussolini will be there, Lenin will be there, Biden will be there. No, <laughs> <laughs> they will come to a point in time for most after they die. In other words, what we're saying is the universalists believe a man may die, but he's still going to be saved because the place that he goes after he dies is going to have the opportunity of confessing Christ as he will. Because Paul says, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. 
Now, some say they go to hell. Though most of those people who are universalists don't believe in hell, but some would say they go to hell temporarily or they go to some intermediate abode, whatever that is, maybe purgatory. Once they confess Jesus as Lord, they will be transported from their temporary state right to heaven. The problem with this theology is that nowhere in Scripture are we promised a second chance after we die. That is why Paul said, I tell you, now is the time of God's favor, and now is the day of salvation. Salvation begins in this life with its full benefits in the next life. It's, you know, it's now or never. That's what it is. So we've seen the greatness of God in the context of Isaiah chapter 45. We have learned that he is sovereign over all. That he even controls the pagan kings of the world to fulfill his purposes. We have learned that he is superior to other gods. That he alone is God. That there is no other God beside him. We have learned that he is straightforward. And no one is to strive against him or question his judgments. We have learned that he calls for submission to his will and his ways. And that as man's creator, we have no authority to tell God what to do. We have learned that he is Savior and has a message of salvation that is for all people and it extends to the ends of the earth. We have learned that he is sovereign, that he is king, and in the end, every knee shall bow before him, and every tongue shall confess that he alone is Lord. The sad truth is, for too many, their confession will come too late. Hey, the thing that's good here is be grateful to God that you have known him in this lifetime so that you can be with him in the next lifetime. Yes, God is great and God is good. Let us thank him. Amen.